Struggling with drag should not be illegal. Drag is art. Drag is joyful. Drag is fashion. It's fun. It's entertainment. Drag is all about love and self-expression. Drag is not meant to hurt anybody. But recently, we have some legislation coming out in a lot of conservative states attacking drag and attacking the queer community. So, a lot of you might be familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a super famous drag competition that's been running for 15 seasons. Uh, RuPaul is the most famous drag queen probably there is, and a lot of really famous and successful drag queens have come from this show as well. So picture here we have RuPaul, and we have some of the contestants from the most recent season. Uh, the queen in the red dress over here is that, well, I don't want to spoil it if anyone's watching it, but she won this season, and she's actually a trans woman. So this is a new movement in drag that we're really starting to have a lot more acceptance for what drag is, because drag used to just be men impersonating women, and that's not always necessarily the case. So to get into the politics of what's going on, um, there's, I have no idea why that picture is missing. The picture was supposed to be a drag queen reading with us because drag queen story time is like this super innocent concept where drag queens go to libraries and read books to kids and play dress up. And um, that's kind of what's being attacked in our Iowa bill. So the bill in Tennessee that really started everything was attacking drag altogether. So their bill bans drag shows in public places around the state, effectively criminalizing them. So if people perform in drag or at a venue's host a drag show or you attend a drag show, there's like criminal offenses to this. So it starts with like a penalty and a fine, but you can actually get jail time for being a drag queen, which I think is really messed up. So we just kind of have been moving forward what people think like in a progressive direction, but I still think that there's a lot that we still need to achieve. And obviously this Bud Light can was a perfect example of that. It caused a huge, huge uproar with more conservative folks that may drink Bud Light and don't agree with these ideals. So the Iowa bill uh, is specifically targeting drag queen story time and drag queens being around children because this apparently um, is a hard concept for them to, to grasp and that it's really detrimental to children. But I found this statistic from the Washington Post that says that there have been more than 349,000 students in America that have been experienced in gun violence at school. Not a single child has been harmed at a drag show. So I think that we're a little more concerned about drag shows as a distraction for what also really should be taught. So the specific wording from the Senate file 348, which is the drag ban in Iowa, says it prevents any performance where someone is expressing a gender identity different from their sex assigned at birth in the presence of children. So these bills can be like very vague and like the Tennessee bill too, it talks about just being in public and drag and the repercussions of that. So I think that to talk a little bit about like where drag started is important. So Gender bending and like gender self-expression and fluidity has existed since as long as humans have. There have always been gender queer people. Um, these are two examples of really ancient civilizations. So you have the native Hawaiian culture. They have what's called the mahu. The mahu is a third gender person. So they're kind of neither or but both at the same time. And then in Native American culture, they are called the Luahas. So in these cultures, these people were seen as divine because they were lucky enough to be blessed from the gods to be able to embody both a male and female experience. And they were really sought after as like healers and teachers and were really trusted with children because they are caring and can relate to anyone. So going forward a little bit, oh, this picture's really blurry. So basically, drag started becoming called drag um, in the late 19th century. So there's definitely documentation of people like cross-dressing before, like even Shakespearean times, men often dressed as women in plays. Um, but according to an article from the website Them, 
Jags started around the late 19th century, and it was a term used by men in theater productions because they'd be putting on these long dresses with petticoats that dragged on the floor, so they'd be putting on their drags, and that's where the name originated from, which I think is interesting. Um, and then you moved into like more the 1920s, and in England, it was still considered criminal to be gay. Um, so there was a secret language that was kind of established in the community called Polari um, that was used by gay people because they needed a way to communicate and still feel safe. So I think that that shows that creating a safe space for the queer community has always been important and drag shows are just one place that you can feel safe. Um, the, sorry. So yeah, that was born out of like the criminalization of homosexuality in England. So we've come a long way since then, but there's still a long, long way to go with the big fight. Like I would wish I could get into all of the serious history that gay people have really had to deal with and trans rights is becoming like a new form of activism that's really important. Uh, but drag eventually evolved into, you know, the entertainment that we know today. So I think this is really interesting to talk about because every single person in drag on this slide is actually a straight man. So it's acceptable in straight men to be drag because it's seen as humorous, but when a queer person does it, it's seen as odd or unnatural. But what is really the difference is what I would like to discuss because there's no difference between a man or a woman putting on a leg if they're straight or if they're gay. There's not a huge difference. Um, the acceptance of drag for entertainment varies based on who the performers are, if they're gay, straight, or trans. So, I mean, everyone loves Mrs. Doubtfire. Can you imagine criminalizing Robin Williams for playing that role? I just think that it's really silly. So, <coughs> so these two queens right here, this is Trixie Mattel and Bridget Bandit. So both of them are huge like activists and drag queens. I don't think anyone would know by looking at the two of them what gender they actually are. Trixie was born a male, he's a gay man. Bridget does the exact same exaggerated eye makeup and stuff, born a female. So she could legally still perform drag. She's a Texas drag queen actually, and Texas is another state that's really coming after drag and the queer community. But if you look at the two of them, what is really the difference? Presenting that to children, what is really the difference? Obviously this little girl right here is like enamored by Bridget's wig, you know? I think that kids can understand the concept of dress up because it's fun and self-expressive. So just to kind of add on like a note to get you thinking about why these safe spaces are really important and that we should love and accept people, um, there's a NAMI statistic, and NAMI is like the mental health organization, that says LGB youth are more than twice as likely to report depression than their straight peers, and trans youth face further disparities and are twice as likely to commit suicide, have serious mental health issues or addiction issues. And that's because they're already isolated and they're already struggling to find out who they are. And then on top of that, you have the government who should be protecting the people oppressing people so i just want to remind you all drag is an art form it's meant to entertain people and bring people together drag is not meant to hurt anyone but this anti-queer legislation is drag is not and should not be a crime